Hi, everybody. Today, I would like to welcome you to Mother's Day 2020. First, on behalf of us all, I wish perfect health to all mothers on this planet, including our planet itself, our precious Mother Earth. Also, I would like to introduce my daughter, Tusha Yakovleva, and my best friend, who is going to teach us on the topic of foraging. From my perspective, foraging is an important holistic modality that creates better health for everyone. The conventional food chain harms the environment, animals, plants, and people. And the question for all of us is, is there any positive model? I believe that foraging is one of them. When my daughter was a toddler, I used to take her to the woods. I remember that during her first spring, I showed her young tops of spruce trees, and they were bright green and full of vitality. And I said to her, these sprouted tops are rich of vitamin C. They are better than any supplements or any food you can buy. And of course, my one-year-old girl didn't have any clue about vitamins, supplements, or food shopping. And yet he listened, listened very carefully, actually, very attentively. Um, and I, at that time, I never imagined that my action would con contribute to my daughter's professional path as an ethnobotanist who sincerely cares about the peaceful coexistence of all beings, people, plants, animals, insects, birds, and our Mother Earth that unites all of us as one family. And the last thing I would like to mention is that, um, that from the perspective of the Buteyka method, foraging is a wonderful way to increase our CO2 levels, our vital energy, or our prana. Foraging consists of several elements essential for health improvement. The first one is long, slow cardio activities, being outdoors, and also eating local, seasonal, and organic. So it's a wonderful health improvement tool. And now I would like to ask Tusha, my daughter, to step in. Hi, good morning. Um, thank you very much for that lovely introduction, Mom. And thank you for inviting me here, and thank you to all of you for, for joining us this morning. Um, I have a lifelong passion for wild foods and foraging. Um, you can probably tell where that comes from. <laughs> um, and I, some of what I hope, um, some of my goals for our time together are to, to help you get to know some of the plants that very well, um, very likely grow, grow near you and then start to consider how to, um, to develop relationships with them and to, um, to interact with them in ways that are, um, are positive and mutually beneficial both to you and, and to the plants that you both um, share a home with. Um, so we will be together for probably a little over an hour. Um, and uh, in that time, we'll touch on um, on foraging as, as a practice for, for personal environmental health. Uh, I'll introduce a few very, very common uh, edible plants and ways that uh, you can use them in the kitchen. And uh, Sasha and I will also share a little bit of more about our history as foragers, which I'm really looking forward to. And I would um, invite all of you to share your experiences as well. My workshops uh, are generally outdoors with plants and with food and with everyone being together. 
And um, although we can't have the first two elements, we can certainly still um, share our, our knowledge and our personal experiences. And I think, in my experience, that's the best way to learn about plants. Um, so throughout, I will pause for questions, but um, also feel free to, to raise your hand if something comes up in the moment. And in that spirit, I would like to start by asking if anyone would like to share um, an experience they've had uh, foraging for food plants or, and or perhaps who, who taught you how to do that. I, I, I uh, foraged for mushrooms before and have, en have enjoyed that very much. I'm in Connecticut and uh, we joined, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Okay, we joined the Connecticut Valley uh, Mycological Society. So um, we foraged with very experienced people and um, who knew a lot about poisonous mushrooms and edible mushrooms. In fact, when people um, got uh, poisoning from mushrooms, they would go to some of our leaders and ask them about them. And um, I found that a lot of fun. Uh, originally, I was looking for a group to uh, look for uh, uh, vegetables, you know, like uh, wild mustard and things like that, but I couldn't find anything around me. So we ended up doing mushrooms and that has been a lot of fun. I've had um, wild onions. Oh, and uh, ramps. I foraged for those. That, that was fun. <laughs> That's great. Thank you for sharing that. Yep. Great. Um, Christine. I, I um, had an interesting experience. I've just done, um, uh, when I was in Finland, in the Finnish forest, blueberries, wild blueberries. And then just another experience with in the forest where I live, raspberries when they come out. And what I wanted to share is I was so surprised in my reaction. Like, I can't stop. Like, once I start picking, I remember when we were in Finland when there was this big storm coming on and the person said, we should probably stop, but she couldn't stop eating. Memory of how much I absolutely love picking. Thanks. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, I can very much relate to that. It's just, um, like such a natural activity. <laughs> Once you start it, it's and and also um, in response to what Deborah was saying, I, I'm so glad that you were able to connect with with people who have experience foraging. And in, in my opinion, it's it's the best way to learn um, directly from from other people who who um, who have that practice in their lives. Anyone else? Um, this is Jean. I don't know if you can hear me. Okay. I can't see myself. So it's a little weird, but I, um, uh, just got a book on foraging recently. I moved to Arkansas from the desert and, uh, so I've just recently moved to a place where I don't know any of the plants and I got a book and immediately found something in my front yard, which is called wood sorrel. It's all mm -hmm. over the place. And then, um, you know, other than that, I'm just really new and, you know, I can find dandelions and that's kind of where I'm at. But if there's a lot of plants here, there's a huge variety of trees where I live. I live near hot springs and it's just um, pines and all sorts of uh, hardwoods and everything. So I'm interested in finding mushrooms around here. I have seen, the only thing I've seen so far is a, um, a lion's mane other than that. So I'm getting out there. Thank you, Jean. Um, yeah, well, I'm so, I'm so glad you brought up wood sorrel and dandelions, especially because um, our focus today will be weighed a little bit heavily towards the weeds. And wood sorrel is actually my the very first uh, wild plant I, I remember eating as a child in in Russia. So that sort of gives you a little sense of you know how um, how prolific and abundant these plants are around the world. They're wonderful to um, to start learning from. Um, so, okay, last call for, for comments and then we should probably move on. Hey, this is Margaret Miller. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, we pick Saskatoon, so I'm in Northern Canada, mm. and uh, we pick enough Saskatoons to last us all winter long. 
and it's great because our winter is really long. We don't even have any leaves on our trees right now. So yeah, and we do, we pick, my husband is the mushroom forager for sure and all sorts of mushrooms. That's great. Thank you, Margaret. Yeah, and I, you know, I'm a, I'm Sasha and I are very much people of the North as well. So we um, really value um, food preservation and, and kind of thinking uh, ahead for at least a, 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 a whole seasonal cycle, if not more. And, um, I, I love Saskatoons as well. And I, and I, I bet a lot of folks um, aren't familiar with that term, but um, Saskatoons are a berry of, of many, many names which of course also points to uh, how many uh, long-term rich relationships they have with people. So Saskatoons are the same as June berries or service berries or shad bush or shad, shad blow. They um, uh, taste to me kind of like a mix between a blueberry and an apple and they are ripen quite early in the year. So um, they're a nice uh, dose of vitamins and, and um, fruity sweetness in um, the first part of the summer. Okay, um, so I'm gonna share some images now and keep chatting. Can everybody see this, the images now? Yeah, great. Um, so as, as Sasha mentioned, I'm an ethnobotanist in my professional path which uh, basically means that I, I study the relationship between plants and people. I teach about plants, I write about ecology, I participate in all kinds of projects that um, aim to, to restore plants back to the land and back into their relationships with, with other creatures. And I am also a lifelong forager. So this image is um, just a, a small sampling of um, edible plants that I've harvested over the past two weeks in my, within just a couple of blocks um, of my house in upstate New York in a very, very suburban to urban setting. So these are all plants that are either um, commonly planted as ornamentals or that really thrive, thrive in um, uh, anywhere the soil has been turned, so in disturbance, aka weeds. <laughs> basically. Um, and we will come back to the, the weed subject over and over again, but I just wanted to, um, to place this image here to just show kind of how much, um, how many wild vegetables are available right under our feet, even really early on in the season. And of course, you know, the abundance will only increase uh, throughout uh, till fall. So I am a lifelong forager because, um, because I'm from Russia, essentially. It's, it's not uh, unusual. Um, that the practice is not unusual there. It's, it's very um, normalized and commonplace. Um, in Russia, it's, it's knowledge that's um, very important to pass between generations. In fact, it's, I would say it's so important that it's not even really talked about that much. It's just practiced. It's just something that you do. And um, these images here are just some, some random um, photos from, or um, illustrations from fairy tales and children's books that I grew up with. And um, that sort of, I, I like how they illustrate the, um, and the practice of foraging is really at the core of the culture. So you can see, you know, both human beings and non-human beings cooking, gathering, um, communicating with one another. There's a little girl speaking to a mushroom, which it seems uh, normal. <laughs> um, there is a birch tree who is also a woman. Um, who is uh, singing, I believe. Um, you know, it's, uh, and one thing just in, in um, fitting with the theme of Mother's Day that I found interesting when I was searching for these images is that the majority of the human characters in these stories are female. And I think oftentimes, you know, the, the role of um, caretaking through, foraging through, providing food for the family, 
at least in Russia and in many, many other cultures around the world, is the role of, um, of the mother. Um, it's a nice connection with today. Um, so I've been thinking uh, a lot recently and talking a lot to my, um, my grandparents about how actually they've been bringing this up about how they learned about wild foods during a time of great food shortages. And that's something that they are um, really thinking about during this turbulent uh, food time, during this turbulent spring. Um, and, you know, they, of course, then taught their kids, my parents, perhaps with the intention of alleviating the danger of a similar hunger in the future. And then, of course, when I was a child, my parents um, passed that knowledge on to me. Our, our, um, at our house, the seasons were marked with seasonal foods. We had birch juice on our table in the spring to celebrate getting through winter. We hunted for mushrooms as a family. This is probably my, I imagine my first, of, <laughs> one of my very first mushroom outings with my mom. Um, and we just spent a lot of time exploring plants. So I, um, with that in mind, I would like to ask my mom, um, Sasha, why she chose to participate in these aspects of the culture why it felt important to pass this knowledge on to the next generation. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to <laughs> go this. Um, well, what I would like to share, why? Well, I really didn't think why at that time. I just did what uh, my parents taught me. Um, but I think, um, one of the big reasons for it was that foraging is um, creates a lot of joy. Being outdoors, moving, uh, the excitement of hunting, whether hunting for mushrooms or some other plants, is uh, just great. So we used to do it as a family a lot, um, Tisha's father myself and our baby and it would just create a wonderful very healthy and very joyful activity for the whole family thank you i agree with that as well <laughs> it's a lot of fun um a great way to be together yeah and um you know, for me it's it's still uh, and I imagine my mom would agree with this, it's still a, a huge way of how we connect as a family. And also for me, as, as someone who lives far from my first homeland, it's, it's, it's the strongest way that I know to kind of feel rooted in place, um, in any place really, wherever I live. And it's, it's also an easy way to, to feel present, to find presence and to kind of slow down time. Um, and also on a, on a be slightly less joyful note, you know, I'm, I'm uh, of a generation that has lived with the ecological and political threat of climate change for most of my adult life. And foraging really feels like a, a powerful way to help, um, to help other people remember and regrow their relationships to the land. Um, and also to, to strengthen food security and the health. Of, of my communities. I meant to actually have <laughs> this up to show another image of my mom and I foraging now on a different continent, upstate New York, a couple of years ago. Those are giant buff balls that we found. Okay, well, um, and I, I think it's important to note that, you know, the, uh, the spring, we're in a, in a pandemic and, um, those, those foraging generations of all, of my, my own generation and, or sorry, foraging motivations of, of all the generations that I've mentioned, um, food security, personal health, climate change, connection to place and family, um, just pure joy, are, are, they have been very much at the forefront of my mind and they feel like um, they're all aspects that are essential to, to our well-being always, but, but perhaps in, a, in an extra highlighted way right now. 
And as a foraging teacher, I'm, I'm see that I'm not the only one who is thinking this way. I'm seeing a, a really large surge in interest in foraging and gardening in various ways of, of um, being active on the land. Um, and that brings me some cautious but, but great optimism because it, I think turning back to, to, the, to activating those relationships again with the land has the potential to help us grow um, a healthier world for, for all beings. So with that in mind, um, we can pause for questions for a second and then return to the weeds. Does anyone want to add anything at this moment? Okay. I, I was wondering if you were going to describe what the, uh, all the different plants that you were uh, had on display. I'm not going to describe describe all of those just because of, there are over 30 there and we would okay. be here for the rest of the day. Um, I'm happy to um, to annotate them and, and send them out later. Um, but I'm going to introduce some other plants um, oh, okay. that are common. Okay. So cool. um, thank you for asking that. Um, so again, with the weeds, um, you know, I think there's, there's a common misconception that uh, you need to go kind of into an exotic locale deep into the woods in order to forage. Um, and uh, in my experience, that's really not where the abundance of diversity and quantity of food is. Abundance is, is kind of at the edge or anywhere really the soil that has, where there's soil that has been um, moved. Yeah, so, so anywhere the soil has been, has been turned, whether it's from construction site or a guard, or, you know, gardening or um, the side of a trail, that's where a lot of the best food plants grow. Um, and it's, it's also um, a habitat that most people have access to and know. And so those same plants show up um, really uh, almost all across the planet. So this photo here, it, it just shows a few examples of what I'm talking about. So <clears throat> on the top left is a parking lot in San Francisco and there is a huge, um, very happy mallow plant, which is an amazing cooking herb, um, cooking green. There are also some plantains, which are um, really powerful first aid plants and good as a food as well. On the top right, uh, is a brush pile about three weeks ago in upstate New York. And as you can see, none of the trees have leafed out yet. There isn't a lot of vegetation, but in the brush pile, Dame's Rocket, which is a wild mustard, so a relative of cabbage and broccoli and kale, is, um, is prolific and is in perfect stage to, to harvest. Down on the bottom right is a community garden plot that was used actively last fall. So between the end of last season, when the gardeners stopped tending to it in this spring, it has filled up with all of these spontaneous vegetables. So there's lesser celadine, there's garlic mustard, there's um, nettles. They're taking advantage of this open niche and growing and could be providing a lot of nutri nutrition um, and calories for people. And then on the left um, is the photo that we used for this workshop, which shows um, a harvest in southern Colorado also in the spring of Siberian elm seeds and um, white top mustard, which is another wild mustard considered very invasive in the West and is very similar to broccoli in both taste and appearance, as you can see here. Um, just to spend another few minutes on kind of my arguments for weeds as, as sources of food. You know, as I said, they're growing all around us in abundance. So it's easy to harvest them without hurting plant populations. And in some cases, when they're especially abundant, harvesting them may also help bring um, a little bit of ecosystem balance and open space for other sensitive plants. They are delicious and they're nutritious. They're plants that live really fast lives. Um, so they really don't devote energy to producing any kind of toxins or to even producing um, uh, like defenses on the leaves, tough leaves. So they're very palatable as well. 
And um, oftentimes their nutrition is, is superior to cultivated vegetables, essentially because they are breeding themselves for um, best chances of survival rather than being cultivated for appeasing our sweet tooth or for long shelf life in a supermarket. And finally, they're they are often considered weedy and growing far away from their origins because of, um, because of our ancestors, for many of us who considered them important sources of food and medicine and therefore moved these plants around the world to have them um, available for those purposes. Um, and of course, it's important to note that weeds are also much criticized, maligned, um, this image here is from a, um, some kind of industrial agriculture uh, newsletter. And I think it's really illustrative of um, this relationship that, uh, of this kind of forced dichotomy between weeds and agriculture. Um, so what's shown here is a monocropped field of soybeans with this big bad monster weed. And this big bad monster weed is, um, is amaranth. So amaranth, uh, as I'm sure some of you know, is, has a really, really long-term um, rich relationship uh, as a provider of, of food for, for people, um, people all over, but especially in um, Mesoamerica, high up in the Andes, it's a complete protein grain it's, um, it produces really reliable, huge harvests. And then in this setting, um, it, has, um, it has been able to outcompete herbicides such as Roundup, which is why it's considered such a huge threat for industrial agriculture. So it's both a super weed and a super food. Um, yeah, so I think this points to just kind of those forgotten relationships, but also an opportunity for restoring them, if we can remember um, all of the different ways we can relate to, to say, amaranth. Not to mention um, the important ecological roles that many of these wild plants serve. They help with erosion, they feed pollinators, they filter water, the list goes on and on and on. And they're also, the, as I've already introduced, they're, they're often the relatives of the crops that we do know. And in that way, they're also the potential vegetables of tomorrow. Yeah, so just the last note on, um, on weeds is that, you know, by definition, a weed is a plant that's growing somewhere where it's not wanted. So to befriend that plant is to essentially get rid of weeds and in that way to participate in your local food system, the most local food system, to use fewer fossil fuels, fewer pesticides, and take um, pressure off of plants that are potentially over-harvested in sensitive environments. And with that in mind, here are a few of the weeds that I want to introduce you to that are most likely growing very, very near you. So amaranth, as I said, um, superweed. It um, there are actually two edible parts. There's the grain, which you can purchase commercially, but you can also just wait until um, your local amaranth goes to seed, and then collect that grain. And then there's also a really amazing greens um, greens phase. And what's nice about amaranth, unlike a lot of other greens, it is extremely heat tolerant. So these greens that you see on the right are, um, they are ready to be harvested in the peak of summer when many more sensitive greens are having a really hard time um, staying fresh, basically. And they taste very similar to spinach. They're a relative of spinach. They make, um, and they can be used comparably to spinach. Okay, next I have a very mysterious plant that no one has ever seen, very exotic. <laughs> Can anyone tell me what, what we're looking at? It's like a dandelion. 
Absolutely, yeah. Beloved dandelions. Um, dandelions are, I could talk about dandelions all day. They're incredible and I, in so many ways, I will restrain myself and just <laughs> um, introduce them as, as food. So um, they, are, um, they are relative of, of lettuce and artichokes. They're in the, the um, sunflower lettuce family. They, uh, every part of the dandelion is edible. So in, in many climates, they actually produce food for the whole year. Um, in, in more Northern settings, uh, obviously winter is, <laughs> is a limitation, but only in the sense that the soil is frozen. Really, if you can get to the dandelion root, it's available even in winter. So, um, with a dandelion too, it's, it, it, um, dandelion is a good, um, a good plant to talk about uh, how to, to harvest and when to harvest plant parts with, um, because it has so many edible stages. So one way to think about when to harvest, which part of the dandelion is to consider what, um, what part of its body the plant is sending the most energy into in that moment. So a few weeks ago, around, uh, where I am, the leaves were, were coming up, they were growing, they were photosynthesizing, they were um, really robust. Now um, the flowers have opened and the plant is, is devoting all of its, or most of its resources to producing flowers. Next, it will make seeds, of course. Um, and then later on in the season, it will go back to, to um, prioritizing leaves. And then at the very end of the season, in the autumn, as well as the winter and early spring, all of the energy will go down into the root. So as a food, um, dandelion, uh, has, has some bitter parts and some absolutely non-bitter sweet parts. Um, oftentimes folks who have a little bit of experience with dandelion kind of turn their noses up at it because they've tried um, a particularly bitter uh, uh, part of it. So the leaves um, are make an excellent cooking green. And if you are sensitive to those bitter flavors, one way to to get rid of some of them is to just um, evaporate them. So cook it uh, uh, with some oil on a, on a pan with, with no top. And some of those bitter, bitter sap uh, will just go away. The flour is not bitter at all. Um, neither is, I think I have an image of it, yeah. Neither is the crown, which is the part that connects the root to the leaves. And um, the roots also in their tender stage make an excellent non-bitter um, roasting or soup vegetable. And when they're a little bit older, they do acquire that bitterness and they make a great um, substitute for, or not substitute, they, they make a nice bitter drink like coffee. Stinging nettles, this is another one of my favorites. Um, Mom, do you want to tell us anything about your experience with singing nettles? Well, I remember that we used to make uh, nettle soup when you were small, and then I just dis I discovered that it's possible to simply fry nettle on a frying pan, and it was just delicious food in full of vitality which I enjoyed tremendously. Now I live in a high mountain desert and there is no nettle around and I really miss it actually. And I also Tisha, very grateful to you for sending me dry nettle almost every year. And I often add it to soups and to pasta and it's just absolutely delicious. It's wonderful. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's one of my favorite uh, 
greens. And it's, it's also, it's one of the most nutritious greens that, that is available to, to us as humans. Um, and of course, it, uh, nettles have a pretty serious, pretty powerful defense, uh, defense system for themselves. So it's important, this is a good plant to, to really kind of go slow and, and get to know before you consider harvesting. So that defense, uh, mechanism, the stinging part, are these tiny little needles that come off of the leaves and off of the stem, and they have uh, a little bit of formic acid in them, which doesn't hurt you, but is very uncomfortable, feels like a bee sting. So th those needles are also very, very sensitive to, um, to any kind of agitation. So as Sasha mentioned, boiling them certainly does it, drying them gets rid of the needles, even blending them up for a pesto, any kind of way that you basically flatten those needles will get rid of them. So I like them very much at, um, at this time of year as just a, a mild cooking green. And then later on in the season, I primarily dry them for tea or um, occasionally for, I will dry them and then, um, and then blend them basically to, to make a powder and then use that as a seasoning, sometimes together with salt. Purslane. Um, purslane um, has become kind of a, a, a poster child for this resurgence of, of edible weeds, which is very nice to see. It's uh, again, a very, very common uh, garden weed and it's been showing up even at farmer's markets and, and groceries. Um, now, and you can, you can even buy seeds to, to grow it. Purslane is, um, is another plant that likes the heat. So after the dandelions and nettles, senes, um, comes the time of purslane. It's a great cooking green. It's, also, it's, it's a superior um, fresh green as well. And the stems are kind of succulent and make a great pickles. And purslane is, as all of these plants are uh, a superior source of, of vitamins and minerals, but specifically purslane is a source of omega-3s, which as we know is, is hard to find in the vegetable kingdom. Um, but purslane is one important exception to that. Has anyone here eaten purslane? Deborah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Do you like it, its flavor? Yes. Yeah. How would you describe it? Crunchy. Uh, yeah, we've had it raw. We, we've eaten it raw, and it's quite crunchy, yeah, sweet. crunchy sweet. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, it feels very, it's like a cucumber almost. It has that nice juicy bite. <laughs> okay, and last, uh, not weeds at all. But I, I did want to include the conifers in here, and it was a very nice um, uh, coincidence that, that my mom brought up that, that lovely memory of one of my first experiences with the conifers. Um, so the conifers are here because they are a, uh, also just a, a, a category of plants that, that grows all around the world that that is often planted as, as ornamental and um, is a fantastic source of, of vitamin C, especially at this, at this time of year in the spring when all of these new growth uh, tips are coming up. So we have pine, uh, little baby pine cones, larch, the fresh leaves and the pine cones, spruce tips, of course, and then um, down in the bottom middle is um, is uh, juniper, which is more of a seasoning. But um, I also wanted to include the, the conifers as just a reminder that not all the food is under our feet and trees are also such a fantastic and for some reason often overlooked source of wild foods. And, and one of the reasons they're fantastic uh, on top of this, the same reasons that all of these other plants are is that um, oftentimes you can you can harvest quite a lot of volume of food 
and not hurt the plant at all. So it's a very sustainable food source oftentimes. And then as a safety note, that ominous double red framed <laughs> image on the bottom right there is the yew plant, which looks very similar to other um, conifers. It has, it has needles for leaves. And the yew plant is, is uh, the only member relative of, of this family that's, uh, that's toxic. It actually does have an edible part, but it's, I don't ever talk about it as an edible in my workshops because all but one of its um, body parts is, is very um, dangerous to consume and can actually kill you. So make sure when you are deciding to harvest conifers, make sure you can identify a you, that's the first step. And, um, and also on uh, last note on the conifers, you don't have to just harvest them in the spring. That's just when they're most delectable and best as, uh, as a vegetable. But you can harvest the needles at any time of year and um, consume them as a tea. You get more uh, vitamin C by volume than you would from citrus. And that concludes our brief uh, virtual tour of the common edible plants. And now we're going to move on to a few ways um, to think about them when you bring them inside and into your kitchen. And I would, again, very much welcome anyone else's contributions to this if you have some experience using um, eating wild plants. So instead of providing you with, with just very specific recipes, I thought it would be more helpful to um, discuss four ways to um, consider incorporating these foods into your diet. So the first category add <laughs> is, um, by, by that I mean you can just um, go slow, add one plant at a time, and and add and incorporate it to the foods that you already uh, love that are already part of your cooking regimen. You don't need to aspire to eat 100% wild. That's unrealistic for many people. That's certainly a full-time job for anyone. Um, and often it's just, in my opinion, unnecessary. So that image there is uh, some sauerkraut that I made the other day, and the base of it is cabbage and carrots, but I also added a bunch of um, wild edibles that I've been gathering on my neighborhood walks over the last couple of weeks. So there are dandelion flowers and um, magnolia petals and some wild greens that we've already discussed. Um, one of my, my colleagues, um, Kaya Dearnwater, he, he likes to say that his goal is to to eat one tablespoon of cultural ancestral foods per day. Um, and if he has added that much to his diet, he feels like it's a, a day well lived, which I, I really like that approach. Very gentle. Um, the second uh, preparation that I've dubbed salt here is really just an argument for preserving and for fermenting. Fermentation, as I'm sure many of you know, unlocks so many added nutrients to, uh, that uh, any wild or cultivated vegetable can offer. And it's also, of course, again, for, for Northern people, um, a way to really to survive the winter and get the ample um, nutrition as well as calorie that you need to get through the lean times. And mom, I, I know you have a lot of thoughts about salt. <laughs> would you like to share some of them with us? Well, I would just, uh, I would like to add that um, salt is a very important uh, part of the Buteyka method. And Dr. Buteyka believed that it's very difficult to restore health without using salt. And I have my own personal story about salt because for many years I had problems with my kidneys. 
had a lot of pain in my kidneys and only when I started practicing Dr. Buteka's approach and eating salt, um, I was able to stop this health issue. Um, salt contains, uh, I mean like natural salt, not the refined one, contains a lot of minerals which we need and I believe that the traditional food for example, which is very common in Russia, like sauerkraut or uh, uh, pickles, which contain a lot of food, is really good for people's health. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, and sauerkraut is something that, that Sasha and I have made together most years of, of my life and um, is, is just a very important um, seasonal tradition, well, to me personally, but again, to, to kind of Russian culture. Um, and we generally just, we kind of, we, we almost always start with, with cabbage, um, just because that's what we, we know, that's what we're used to. But it's a process that you can do with, um, with just about any vegetable. Some of the drier ones, like what's pictured here are dandelion flowers they might need uh, a little help uh, producing brine, so you might want to add some water to them. But for, for many vegetables that are juicy, it's really, it's really just a matter of vegetable plus salt plus time um, to get that process. Obviously, there's a lot of nuance to that, but, it, but it's also just a matter of you know, getting in the practice of, of doing that. And it becomes pretty intuitive. Um, on the bottom right, uh, under dry, the heading dry, uh, I have a couple of window screens that are, show that are showing um, herbs as well as mushrooms in various stages of, of dehydration. And that's a really nice uh, kind of um, gateway method to wild foods, I would say, because it can, it can be done in really, really small batches. You don't need any kind of special equipment, um, you, uh, it, it can be something that you just do throughout the season. So, so many of the herbs that I, um, or wild foods rather, that I preserve throughout the year, I will just collect them in really small amounts as I, as I pass them on my travels. And then I will bring them home and lay them out to dry. And then I, collect them in those small batches in a jar. And then, you know, as I gather more, the jar fills up for the winter. Um, and it's, it's really um, versatile in how you can then use those foods. So you can use them as tea, you can use them as seasoning, or uh, one super easy and nutritious way to use them is to just add them to your soup uh, base your soup foundation. Um, something else I want to say about drying. Oh, just that it's nice that it's not dependent on electricity also. Um, and then finally, uh, this is the most general category, um, pull. And by pull, I mean pull out plant constituents, plants, chemicals, using some kind of liquid. So, you know, I. I as I said, many of these weedy plants are more palatable than, than other wild foods to get used to, but that doesn't mean that they are, are something that you will like from the first bite. Some of them have, do have some semi-challenging textures or flavors. And one way to kind of start incorporating those foods without, uh, um, that, uh, basically um, circumventing that barrier is by putting them into an oil or vinegar or on the more medicinal side uh, into alcohol as a tincture or into honey. Uh, and all of those liquids, they, they um, again, with some time, they start pulling out the, the beneficial nutrients and minerals out of the plant. So when you consume that liquid, you then get, get the, the nutrients. Does anyone have any favorite wild food recipes that I'd like to share? 
the group. Uh, I can share one. Please, yeah. Sorry. So, uh, I am from Lithuania, but I have been living in Canada so for five years. So the only thing I've learned is Dandalian um, mm -hmm. that I could eat. But we were picking herbs and mushrooms and berries in Lithuania my whole life. So the only thing what I do, the, not the only thing, but a couple of things. So with the dandelion, I do the smoothie. So usually mm. kiwi, banana, dandelion, and some coconut water or almond milk, whatever I have on hand. So it's a little bitter, but it's very good. And then we actually fry dandelion. So we add to pasta or to omelet. So like spinach. So this is what I do with that. <laughs> that sounds great. And I do sharing. Do you use leaves? Ah, uh, sorry. Do you use leaves for both recipes? Yeah. Yeah. I use leaves. Mm -hmm. Uh, but also, uh, also we are picking mushrooms here. We're learning as well about mushrooms. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. So I'm on a, <laughs> on a learning path. That's great. Oh, as the rest of us. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the last little bit um, that I want to share with you before we can open this up to discussion, more open discussion and questions, is uh, just general foraging guidelines and considerations, um, which, you know, with, with foraging, because it's something that for many of us has been a little bit forgotten, there's a lot of fear that's associated with it. And, you know, some, there are some dangerous aspects. Um, but uh, for the most part, it's a very, very safe activity. So with my, my guidelines that I like to share, I kind of, I, I, call, I, I call them uh, under them, I, I categorize them under the umbrella of safety, but by safety, I mean safety for both yourself as well as the plants and the, the ground that you both call home. So the first uh, element of safety is identification. You should always be. 100% sure of what you're harvesting. And my advice is to just go slow with your learning process. Um, I think it's nice to start with one or, or a couple of plants at a time and ideally follow them through their complete growing cycle before you decide to harvest them. Um, there, are, there are some that are, you know, that are already familiar to you or that are so familiar to many people that Maybe you don't have to do that, um, dandelion being the prime example. But um, in general, I think it's nice to kind of develop that relationship over time. Because in that, you're also developing a relationship with, with the place where those plants are growing. Um, and now is a perfect time to start learning plants and start uh, foraging, because we're, of course, at the very beginning of their growing cycles. So you can see them all the way through. Um, the second point of identification that I've already uh, mentioned with the dandelion is when to harvest which part of the plant. So it's not, there are some plants that uh, develop uh, toxicity in, in certain parts of their bodies and so you obviously don't want to harvest them uh, at those times, but for the most part it's really a matter of, of, uh, of uh, flavor and, and texture. So if you like with dandelion, if you harvest a part of it that the plant is not sending most of its energy into in that moment, you will just end up with a very, very fibrous, chewy, uh, bitter bite. Um, and some of the sort of general flows to consider when you're thinking about which, what is the, the part of the plant that it's sending the most energy into is um, kind of comparable to garden vegetables. So in the early spring, it'll be the greens, which will then be replaced by flowers, which will then be replaced by fruit and seeds. And then in the fall, 
there will be roots added to that. And it's not like there isn't overlap between those stages, but in general, that's kind of what you can expect in the growing season. Um, the second point of safety is location. So unfortunately, we live in a world where there are a lot of places where it is not safe to harvest plants for consumption. Um, that might be common sense to, to this group. Um, just, you know, the, the only real kind of general advice I can give on that front is look at the spot where you're considering harvesting and ask yourself, is this a place that I would be comfortable eating from? <laughs> um, and some of the more specific considerations are, of course, an application of herbicides or pesticides, which many, especially weedy plants, um, experience. Um, if it's a roadside, there might be some, some pollution from, from traffic. If it's an aquatic plant, you have to be careful about what is uh, the cleanliness of that water. And then the third and final point of safety uh, is your ethical protocol when it comes to harvest. So, you know, when, when you're considering harvesting wild plants, there are a lot of decisions that go along with it. Which plants should you harvest? How many? How? When? So I think with that, it's always important to kind of place yourself in the middle of an ecosystem and consider what other beings and elements are also dependent on those plants or also in relationship with them. Um, one of my, uh, my great mentors, uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer, who is an amazing writer, um, scientist, and she, she talks a lot about the, the intersections and, and joint lessons of indigenous science and Western science. She uh, likes to talk about some of the, uh, likes to uh, put this in, uh, the, this, this um, is relates to some tenets of, of uh, indigenous guidelines for uh, right relations with plants. And she talks about harvests uh, in terms of one's uh, sense of respect, responsibility, and reciprocity. And I think it's a really neat framework to kind of go into um, a field or a forest or a garden with and consider how you are um, exhibiting all of those characteristics. And uh, with that in mind, I, I was wondering if, if anyone would be willing to share some ideas for how you can be a responsible, uh, respectful forager and have reciprocal relationships with the plants you're foraging. Um, I have a question. What yeah. was the name of the woman you were just talking about? Her uh, name is Robin Wall Kimmerer, and um, Wall the book that she is best known for is called Braiding Sweetgrass. Oh, I've heard of that. Okay. Um, well, one, I, I think one thing, a uh, way to be respectful is not to take everything that's there, not to clear it all out, to leave um, an opportunity for the plant to reproduce, to produce seeds, and for the cycle to continue. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? I'd like to share that you know, when I grew up in Russia, I was always taught that you cannot take a mushroom with a root. And uh, everyone who was doing um, mushroom hunting had to have a knife and to cut kind of the top of the mushroom, leaving the root inside. And that was really important for, you know, that for, you know, to keep mushrooms uh, growing in that area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are both such important considerations for, for future generations, right, of both people and, and the plants or mushrooms that you're interacting with. Um, another thing I thought of is that you, you don't want to disturb the area too much, you mm -hmm. know, to destroy it. You want to leave it um, as it, you know, as you saw it when you first came. Um, I think of that especially for mushrooms. 
Definitely, yeah, that's been on my mind a lot recently as um, so many people in the Northeast are harvesting uh, rams, those wild onions. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's, they're so, uh, they've become so popular and, and um, uh, popular as a, as a sellable good as well. And they're on one hand really abundant seeming, on the other hand, they're becoming endangered because they have such a slow regeneration cycle that when you harvest a lot of them, you might not see um, the detriment to their population right away, but really you're, you're destroying the next, you know, the seven to 14 years of, of ram populations potentially. But, but one, um, so this is just an, a, a kind of an ongoing, big uh, controversial conversation among, at least among foraging circles. But one, um, element of it that I think doesn't get talked about often, although I'm hearing more and more about it this year in particular, are the plants that live, the plant communities that the ramps live with. So there are all of these really, also again, slow growing, really have uh, plants that like to be in, in specialized habitats that are really important for certain forest animals that are just uh, inadvertently getting trampled when someone goes in and um, without considering them, the other plants harvest ramps. Anyone else? Yeah, I wonder, I don't, I don't know that this is an answer, but I wonder about the deer where I live, there's a lot of deer and they're always very hungry. I mean, they're a lot hungrier in, um, in winter, but um, I don't know what effect foraging would have on them where I live. I live in like in the middle of a forest and I'm probably the only forager in my community out here. So, but um, I do kind of wonder about that and the deer population. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good to consider the other foragers, whether they're human or not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think also from my perspective, there are um, some, actions that you can take that aren't directly related to foraging, but that are also very much building these, these positive relationships, like picking up trash when you go into the woods, or like planting a, a garden and um, sharing the harvest, um, or um, just sharing some of the, the knowledge that you have about these plants and about um, ways to, to interact with them in harmonious ways. Hmm save seeds there's a lot of approaches I think yeah let's see well I guess another this is changing subjects a little bit but only semi but I'd be remiss um, not to, to bring this up I think another consideration for for so many uh, people living in in the United States at least is that we're living on land that was taken from um, indigenous communities and then manage in a way that depletes biodiversity. So I think also for, for foragers, it's, it's really important to make sure that uh, your practices aren't perpetuating those extractive, destructive, or um, colonial patterns. And again, that's something that could look different ways for different people, but is, is an important consideration. And, and um, to me personally, that's another kind of argument, pro, pro weeds argument, um, because again, those, those plants are already growing in disturbed areas. They are so, so, so abundant. And for, for many of us, those are our ancestral foods. So it's kind of, um, if you're thinking about harvesting, um, if you, yeah. So it sort of, uh, in some ways, alleviates the decision of whether to harvest other people's ancestral foods. So foraging is a powerful environmental, agricultural, political act for, for good or for detriment. And um, that is really all I have to share with you. I can, um, this is a, a little book that I wrote recently that delves into um, these subjects some more. It's available for free on my website. I'm also happy to share um, some, some resources with, with anyone who is interested in terms of um, helpful books or kind of uh, further um, guidelines for further learning 
etc. I'm happy to stay in touch about about wild plants always. So. so that's about it for me. Okay. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. It was very, very helpful. helpful. Thank, Thank you. All. And happy Mother's Day, all you mothers. <laughs> happy Mother's Day. Take care. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs>